Стюарт ничего не рассказывал мне о своем детстве, но его мама Хелен, она любила вспоминать. Это была очень крепкая, традиционная шотландская семья. Своего рода символ Шотландии для меня. Они были добрыми, скромными, честными, сильным чувством долга перед семьей и обществом. Они ходили в церковь, хорошо знали Библию, старались жить по христианским заповедям. Стюарт был близок с родителями, и я думаю, что он наследовал многие их черты. Отец Стюарта был профессиональным строителем в карьере. Он работал бригадиром в Министерстве труда и строительства. Отец Стюарта по отцовской линии был мясником. Я была удивлена, когда Стюарт сказал мне об этом, поскольку сам он был настолько безобидным человеком, что боялся причинить вред даже насекомым. Мать Стюарта была дочерью фермера. Она посвятила себя семье, была очень хорошей домашней хозяйкой. У Стюарта также была сестра Энн, которая была моложе его на три года. Джош и Хелен дали своим детям очень хорошее образование. В доме часто звучала музыка. Хелен была сама очень музыкальной и пела в хоре даже тогда, когда ей было почти 90 лет. И Стюарт, я думаю, унаследовал свою музыкальность именно от нее. Стюарт учился играть на фортепиано и скрипки с детства. А когда ему было 16 или 17 лет, он первый раз попробовал играть на органе. И с тех пор он уже совершенствовался как органист. Когда ему было 18, он сдал экзамен в Королевском колледже музыки, получив квалификацию преподавателя фортепиано. А через 6 лет он стал членом Королевского колледжа органистов. I first met Stuart Campbell in October of 1975. I was a very new music student in the department at Glasgow, studying for a BMUS, and he was a very new lecturer. Our first meeting was the Monday morning, the first day of term, at 10 o'clock in the morning for Counterpoint and Harmony. And it was an excellent lesson. And I came out thinking, if all of university is going to be as good as this, it's going to be brilliant. And indeed, life with Stuart was brilliant. He was a splendid lecturer. His history lectures in particular were wonderful. They were well researched, beautifully delivered with a little touch of humour here and there. And it was just such an exciting experience to be taught by someone who was such an enthusiast. He loved his subject. He cared for his students. And really, it was just a smashing combination. I found his, his, his lectures always engaging, well-referenced, really uh, quite inspiring. I wrote several essays for Stuart. Um, Stuart wasn't always the quickest at marking, um, but when the marking, if I, when his piles of marking, in his, I can visualise his office with piles of marking, which built up across the year, and uh, eventually they would go down. But when we got our feedback from the essays, it was always fairly short very precise to the point and told you exactly what you needed to do next in a very few number of words. 
So it was, and it was always encouraging. The essays themselves were uh, annotated in great detail. So always full of really high quality advice for his students. I was a final year music student doing the BMAS course at the University of Glasgow in 1975 when Stuart Campbell appeared as a new member of staff to teach in the department and also to take over the chapel choir which had previously been conducted by Edward Garden. That was quite a tall order, I think, and Stuart stepped into those shoes very, very well. He was somehow able to take over this slightly frisky group of students, singers, young people wanting to both enjoy the music making and the social life of the choir. He was able to take that over with a great combination of firmness, fairness, and also a spectacular musical knowledge. And I think that combination won us over very quickly as students. And at the end of my first year, I hadn't actually joined the chapel choir at this stage, but was, they were short of tenors and I had the opportunity to go with them to Lithuania on a tour. And uh, I did a little audition, found myself with the chapel choir in Lithuania and loved it so much that I decided to stay with the chapel choir for many years. Stuart, he had the real sense of what the music ought to be like or how he felt it ought to be and was able in his gestures just to convey that uh, naturally uh, to a choir. at that time had a fantastic repertoire. Because we didn't normally sing Anglican services, we didn't have to learn canticles or any of the Anglican liturgy music, but we did have a good repertoire of Renaissance polyphony. And then there was a bit of a jump to 20th century music, uh, both of which we enjoyed immensely and both of which Stuart conducted very, very skillfully. And a lot of us have an enduring love of the music of those periods simply because it was such fun doing it with Stuart. So during my first term, we were preparing music for a cassette recording that was published shortly after that. And we were singing music as modern as Thomas Wilson, an amazing piece called A Babe is Born, which was very demanding and in terms of idiom it uh, took us quite far out of our comfort zone. But Stuart obviously had analysed the piece well and was able to direct us through it superbly. contemporary music, he was a great champion of music by the then professor, Frederick Rimmer. We sang several pieces of Fred's and to very, very great acclaim. a number of times with Stuart with the chapel choir and Stuart was a, a different person on tour, um, slightly more relaxed uh, from the, the stresses of, of work during term time. Um, his musical side always blossomed, the choir um, went from strength to strength as we performed the same repertoire and rehearsed it over and over again intensively and then socially uh, he, he was always there, always at the table, always, always with us. Great chat, um, just a lovely person to be around. I 
I carried on after I graduated from university. I then went to what was then the RSAMD in Glasgow to study singing and still sang occasionally with chapel choir. And also at that point, Stuart and I did some recitals around Scotland where we would go out to a congregation and an organ that was new to both of us and perform some solo pieces of music. Stuart, as ever, was an innate musician, um, a terrific accompanist, a person with amazing understanding of the musical repertoire, both for voices and for the organ music that he was playing. We've been talking about Stuart as a very able choir director, but let's not forget his amazing prowess as an organist. I immediately recall 1985, the 300th anniversary of the birth of Johann Sebastian Bach. Stuart, being Stuart, was not content just with a couple of Bach recitals. Stuart prepared the complete Bach organ oeuvre and performed it over a period of months. Eventually I became the organ student and organ scholar at the University Chapel and Stuart was my mentor during that time. Mentor both in organ playing and, and also conducting and rehearsing at the chapel choir. As a musician, Stuart was exceptional. It was one thing to be able to sit and listen to Stuart or see him conduct. It was it's actually quite another thing to sit beside him at the organ and turn pages for him, to see how he breathed the music, he moved the music. He had, as well as that, a phenomenal technique. Um, so I, I remember uh, him playing uh, Max Reger, Hallelujah, Gott zu loben, uh, incredibly difficult music and making it seem effortless. inevitably drifted slightly, I think, as I went to work in London. Anytime I met Stuart within the university or elsewhere, he was always just himself again, with that winning combination of a great sense of humour, a mischievous sense of humour, a giggle that was unstoppable and used to bubble up sometimes and then have to be suppressed. Stuart had the most incredible sense of humour and I have to confess in the first few weeks of my time as a student I didn't realise it was a sense of humour, it was so dry but eventually the penny dropped and when it did uh, I had many occasions to laugh uh, with Stuart's uh, little quick quips and turns of phrase. Um, he was very very quick uh, in, in his, with his words and always amused, always incredibly gracious in all his all his ways, kind, um, and always had had that sense that he was there looking out for people, always quick to help, just the most warm and lovely gentleman, actually. The first time I met Stuart in a less formal setting, outside the lecture room, was on the 25th of January 1976 when a burn supper had been organised for a group of visiting Soviet students. It was a good evening, a very, very pleasant evening. I found out that he was absolutely fluent in Russian, in fact, a phenomenally good Russian speaker. His knowledge of Russian language was absolutely exquisite 
And being a Russian speaker myself, I know that Russian is one of the most difficult languages on this planet. And Stuart seemed to speak it just like Russians do. He understood the jokes. He was telling the Russian jokes himself. He knew loads of idioms and he knew some of the terms which I have not heard in Russian. So it never ceased to amaze me how beautifully his uh, Russian was. Русский язык он знал безупречно и говорил на нем лишь с едва заметным акцентом. Он также свободно говорил по-французски и, конечно же, по-английски. Английский язык был родным его языком. Он мог также читать по-немецки, по-итальянски, не используя словаря. К русской музыке, как он мне рассказывал, он пришел через русскую литературу. И поэтому его любимым жанром была опера и другие жанры музыки со словом. Разумеется, он изучал и преподавал также другие темы музыкальной истории, в том числе и западной. В течение всей своей профессиональной жизни Стюарт собирал материалы по русской музыке. Его коллекция книг, нот, CD отражает очень широкий круг его интересов. Stuart was a really proficient and broad-ranging musician. His initial framework of study was the uh, life and work of Vladimir Adoyevsky, the uh, very influential critic who died in 1869. He was working on that when I first met him. That was published by Garland Publishers. This was a selection of outstanding dissertations. He also carried out absolutely vital and ext um, extremely impressive translation work. So there are two volumes published by Cambridge University Press of uh, translations of reviews and articles. This is Russian um, commentators talking about the, the great classic works of Russian music. It starts with Glinka's operas and ends with an article by um, Barisa Safiev on the possible future direction of Russian music. It is a wonderful set of translations with very high quality text, beautifully annotated texts. He doesn't let any of the critics who he looks at go by making their factual statements about the music that they're analyzing without checking those factual statements. It provides an immense base of understanding of texts written in the formative years of Russian music and touches on all of the great controversies during that time. At the end of the second volume, you have the Asafiev article in which he's looking at the possible future of, of Russian music and actually saying, well, we still can't really say what Russian music is. What exactly is it? Does it have a future? He says, if it has a future. And he says, I'm very sad to have to use the word if. All of this immensity of uh, development and evolution is, is there and observable in those source materials translated by Stuart. So it is an absolutely invaluable contribution to Russian music studies.
Stewart did many, many things. He spoke internationally at conferences, and he was a wonderful editor, extremely meticulous in that, as, as well as in his work as a, as a critical musicologist, writing commentaries and, and doing translations. He could very modestly appear to be sitting in the background, where actually his commentary uh, can only have resulted from extensive research, absolutely exhaustive on various occasions. So, I mean, one often sits, you know, with, with a great sense of admiration in looking at what he achieved. Stuart, to me, is like a musical oceanographer because he's charting vast areas for students to dip into and understand. Many things that he's said, many items of information that he's brought forward that are still being pondered and examined. He has built up for himself a very impressive reputation based on extremely solid, um, very, very assiduous work. Его сильной стороной как музыковеда было умение рассматривать явления различных музыкальных культур в их сравнении. Но из-за болезни он не смог закончить многие начатые проекты. Например, перевод фильетонов Чайковского и либрета Бориса Годунова-Мусорского. В последние десятилетия жизни Стюарта наши научные интересы переплетались. Например, по моему примеру, он заинтересовался церковной темой и написал очень содержательную статью, посвященную сравнению русской и западной церковной музыки конца XIX – начала XX века. Я изучала музыку в русских православных диаспорах, и Стюарт присоединялся ко мне во время моих исследовательских поездок в разные страны для изучения архивов. В результате он сделал ряд интересных докладов и написал несколько статей, например, о Стравинском и православии, о Рахманинове в Париже и других. Мы часто бывали вместе на конференциях в разных странах, чаще всего в России. Там стерто как музыковеда, русиста очень хорошо знали и высоко ценили. В свою очередь он также прекрасно знал и любил Россию. Как правило, музыковеды не являются исполнителями искусства, которое они изучают. Но Стюарт был отличным музыкантом. Руководство хором и игра на органе в церкви и на концертах занимали очень большое место в его жизни. У меня сложилось впечатление, что в Шотландии, в отличие от России, он был известен прежде всего как хоровой дирижер, органист и университетский преподаватель. Вряд ли коллеги в Великобритании догадывались о его интенсивной научной деятельности в области музыкальной русистики и как хорошо он был известен в России. Later in Stuart's career, he began to do more and more with Russian music, and he did a phenomenal amount of research, not all of which we got to know about. He was a very, very private, a very self-contained and very, very humble person. And finding out what he was working on could be a real ordeal because he really didn't want to, to put himself forward in any way at all. As we discovered how much he was doing, it, became clear that he was really one of the Russian music specialists just about anywhere. And the thought that uh, this very sort of quiet, shy man had such a phenomenal intellect was, was amazing.
So around about 2000, uh, just as uh, Stuart was retiring from his post as university lecturer and organist, uh, I was uh, helping out at the chapel choir service for graduations. And uh, the service had finished and I came down the stairs and um, Stuart was standing at the bottom of the, the chapel stairs um, uh, with, a, with this, this lady. And he, he said, uh, John, I, I really want you to meet somebody who knows an awful lot about you, but of whom you know nothing. John, this is my wife, Svetlana. Uh, well, <laughs> it was very much out of the blue. I, I had no idea, nor did anybody else. But that was the first time I met or had ever heard of Svetlana. I came on the 27th of May, 1990, to Glasgow University uh, to the Chair of Music. So it was after the 27th of May 1990 that I got to know him very well. He was a very private person. He, he never discussed his family or private life uh, with other people, as far as I know, certainly not, not with me. Um, the first that I uh, realised he was married was when he came back from Moscow with Svetlana and uh, he introduced me to her in, in the university music department. Мы познакомились со Стюартом в 1997 году в Москве, где я работаю научным сотрудником в Государственном институте искусства знания. У меня был запасной билет на концерт на котором исполнялась коронационная кантата Глазунова. Стюарт был в гостях у моего коллеги, который дал ему этот билет. Так мы впервые встретились в Большом зале Московской консерватории. Тогда же я пригласила Стюарта на конференцию, которую я организовывала в моем институте. Для начала это была профессиональная дружба, которая была очень успешной и продолжалась до конца жизни Стюарта. Мы поженились в последний день 20 века, и я приехала жить в Шотландию в 2000 году. Мы думали о том, чтобы жить в Москве, но это было время Второй Чеченской войны, и в Москве было много терактов. Неподалеку от моего дома произошел взрыв, и Стюарт решил, что нам с двумя сыновьями лучше жить в Шотландии. Когда я приехала в Глазго, там не было Русской Православной Церкви. И в 2003 году епископ Сурожский Антоний организовал в Глазго Русскую Православную Общину. Нашим первым священником был отец Александр Вильямс из Данблейна. Он попросил нас, еще несколько семей, помочь основать приход в Глазго. Стюарт помогал русским по самым разным вопросам. Например, когда в 2004 году отец Александр ушел из прихода, и мы потеряли помещение, где проходили службы, Стюарт нашел нам новое. Это была церковь Святой Брайды, где он был органистом. Некоторое время я управляла хором в русской церкви. Стюарт помогал организовывать репетиции, давал советы, как лучше обучать певцов. Иногда он сам пел в нашей церкви, поскольку не хватало певцов. Когда я основывала русскую детскую певческую студию, он помогал мне в этом также. В 2005 году была образована русская православная школа, и Стюарт был вовлечен во все аспекты жизни – и школы, и прихода. Во время богослужений он был привратником, занимал детей, пока молились родители, мыл посуду после приходской трапезы. Стюарт помогал всем, кто обращался к нему за помощью, и его очень любили и уважали в русской диаспоре Глазго. He always supported children in Russian school, which is extremely important to me, because I have two children going in Russian school, and Stuart would never refuse to come and play at small children's concerts, and 
after I've learned that Stuart has a doctorate degree and he was a lecturer at the universities, and knowing all his credentials, I know that asking him to come and play at the children's party is the same as asking Salvador Dali or Pablo Picasso to come and help you paint your kitchen. В 2009 году мне позвонила дама по имени Элси Раунд 3. Она спросила, не может ли небольшая группа певцов-любителей в Глазго петь под моим руководством. Стюарт организовал встречу в церкви Сент-Брайт, на которой пришли 15 певцов. Я рассказала о том, в каком направлении может развиваться хор и из каких основных частей будет состоять репертуар. Во-первых, это должна была быть русская церковная музыка, особенно композиции Костальского, Рахманинова, Гречанинова, Чайковского, Чеснокова и других авторов, основанные на церковных распевах. Вторая часть – это русские народные песни. Третья часть – классические произведения на основе произведений русских поэтов. That repertoire of the choral music of Russia, on the whole, is little known in the West. Even now, there are certain things that are well known, um, certain composers, but I don't think I'd ever actually heard, uh, for instance, the uh, Orthodox music that Kostalsky wrote until I heard the Ruskaya Capella do it. Я не видела себя дирижером, но Стюарт сказал, что может мне помочь. И мы обсуждали с ним все хоровые дела и руководили хором вместе. Стюарт был очень опытным и очень хорошим хоровым музыкантом, и поэтому я предоставила ему большую часть дирижирования хором. Я дирижировала в основном литургической музыкой, а также народными песнями, поскольку у меня было больше опытов такого рода музыки. I met Stuart Campbell back in 2012 when I came to join Ruska Capella at the first rehearsal. And they were singing like angels. And I remember Svetlana was making comments and she wanted them to be perfect. And I was sitting there listening to them thinking, I want to sing this music. I want to be with these beautiful voices. And uh, thus Ruska Capella became part of my life, a very important one. And for nine years that I have known Stuart Campbell, he was not just a musical director, not just that perfect choir conductor. He was also a very, very good teacher. He would explain to us what the music meant and how the music and the words work together. And he would always mention that the poem or the words were written by famous Russian poets like Alexander Pushkin. And that was just such a pleasure to sit there and learn and listen to what Stuart was teaching us. When we speak about Stuart Campbell, the one word that comes to mind that can describe him very well is the word perfect, because his knowledge and his attitude to everything was always perfect. He was a perfect gentleman. We regarded him as really a true gentleman in terms of his conduct of the choir. He was inspiring, amusing at times, quite determined, and very well organized. He was always considerate, very friendly, very supportive of individuals. Um, though he could be firm in terms of reaching the standard of music that he had in mind, 
I think that was a characteristic, if you like, of his leadership. Very particular um, about um, accuracy, about uh, pronunciation, which for some of us is a challenge because we're not native Russian speakers. He could explain things both in English and in Russian very quickly. It was not even considered to be a translation. It was really a bilingual conducting of the choir, which is exceptionally important when you have such a mixture of people. It, he was so fast and so quick at coming to a certain word and developing a wee funny story. Facially, he would always make faces. He, when he would want to smile, he would stand there and smile, and we would smile back at him. If he didn't like us singing, he would make a horrible face, and that would make me smile again and laugh. But that was, that was wonderful. I felt like a child in a way, in a very good sense of that word. I got to know Stuart much better when Ruskaya Kapela was formed by the two of them. It was really the Kostelsky Requiem which um, uh, drew us together in this day-by-day -day way toward in the last year or two of his life. The Kostelsky Requiem for Fallen Brothers, it's a memorial piece to the fallen soldiers of the First World War. I think in Russia you could hear it with a, an enormous orchestra of 120 players and a choir of five or 600. That was hardly going to be possible for Ruskaya Capella to do. So uh, Stuart spoke to me about it and, uh, and I said, um, well, how about we do a version of the orchestral score, but I will uh, rearrange it for um, string quartet and double bass. And that's how that project came about. We spent an enormous amount of time in 2017 performing and recording the version of Kostowski, which will be launched on records, is a sort of monument, really the last monument of Stuart's life to his work on Russian music as a director. One fond memory, just a very passing one that I have of Stuart, is that before our performances, he was very um, uncertain about his bow tie. And one of my responsibilities was to put on his bow tie on him and make sure that it was straight before he went on to conductors. The depth of his commitment to quality performance did make him quite nervous before performances. And these indeed took a great deal out of him in terms of nervous energy. And no doubt that was part of his own makeup. Latterly, once we appreciated that he was by no means in good health, we appreciated that that stress was taking its toll it was very evident that he was less at ease, more tense and more irritable latterly. And I think we didn't appreciate at that point how ill he actually was, nor indeed possibly did he. But we appreciated that it was becoming a burden getting 
things up to the standard that he was continually setting. Given our commitment to making a recording, this meant that an additional burden was placed on him. The nature of the music, namely that it required a lot of editing and arranging on Stuart and Svetlana's part, gave it a different set of burdens to a typical choir that simply purchases music and performs it as originally written. There was a lot of work behind the scenes that the average member was simply not aware of, and especially putting in a transliteration for those of us who can't read Cyrillic fast enough to sing from it. Стюарт также выполнял переводы текстов, которые я писала для буклетов, программок и статей, а также делал переводы текстов исполняемой музыки. Наши программы всегда отличались хорошим музыковедческим и переводческим качеством. И теперь у нас есть длинный список репертуара от средневековья до музыки 21 века. Руководить русской капеллой было непросто из-за нехватки певцов. Пение на русском и церковнославянском языке для нерусскоговорящих певцов является трудным делом, и рост хора был очень медленным. Мы со Стюартом отдавали очень много времени хоровым делам. Когда Стюарт вышел на пенсию в университете Глазго, он хотел сосредоточиться на переводческой и исследовательской работе. Но в последние 10 лет жизни большую часть времени и сил все-таки занимала русская капелла. Здоровье Стюарта постепенно ухудшалось, и он сказал мне, что после десятилетия хора он отойдет от хоровых дел. Я ответила, что без него я не смогу руководить капеллой. Но до десятилетнего юбилея капеллы Стюарт так и не дожил, однако в память о нем я продолжаю руководить хором. И у меня есть чувство, что Стюарт мной доволен. Я не могла бы продолжать работу с хором без помощи бывших учеников и певчих Стюарта, а также его коллег, таких как Грэм Хэр, Джон Гормли, Алан Хендерсон и многих других, а также хористов нашего хора, которые стали моей семьей. Родители Стюарта верили в Бога и были глубоко вовлечены в церковную жизнь. Они посещали очень строгую пресвитерианскую церковь, в которой не было ни икон, ни ладана, ни органа, только пения псалмов. Но Стюарт тяготел к более художественному обряду и впоследствии присоединился к епископальной церкви. Он избегал глубоких духовно-философских дискуссий, это отличало его от большинства русских людей, которые любят обсуждать мировые проблемы и глубины бытия. Так или иначе, Стюарт был причастен к православной церкви, постепенно адаптировал православие и сам русифицировался. Но его шотландская идентичность была очень сильной. Это было одной из причин, почему он не хотел переходить в православие. I don't know whether he had spiritual beliefs as such, but I think his spirituality was very connected with the music that he was making and the music he was bringing out of other people.
For someone who spent so much of his time producing religious music in one context or another, it was very difficult to know whether or not he had a strong personal faith. I think he probably did because in his latter years, he was very happy as the assistant organist at St Bride's Episcopal Church in Glasgow. And he was very much part of the congregation as well as being an organist. I always felt that he was very happy to be there. He felt he was in the right place and the choir and congregation adored him. We divide music into sacred and secular only because of the particular usages of them. And I wouldn't say it's a, uh, a description that emphasises the difference in attitudes. So I don't think he saw secular and, and sacred quite in that way. Um, they're just two parts of a comprehensive tradition. I wouldn't put the question in the form, was he religious? I would put it in the form, was he somebody who felt himself of the ongoing tradition, the two millennia old tradition of uh, Christian civilization? The answer is definitely yes. The way I'd describe him as a practitioner really, somebody who tried his best to continue the great traditions of Western civilization in music and Christian civilization. Родители Стюарта умерли, когда им было почти 90 лет. И мы со Стюартом думали, что проведем старость вместе, но этого не случилось. Его смерть была совершенно неожиданной. Он покинул этот мир, будучи в рассвете силы, таланта, и его сестра Энн умерла, когда была еще моложе. Смерть Стюарта потрясла русскую общину. И хотя он не был православным, Отец Георгий Завершинский совершил панихиду над его гробом в церкви Сан-Брайт. Похороны Стюарта, кажется, встряхнули музыкальную общественность Глазго. Церковь Сан-Брайт была переполнена народом. Пела сразу три церковных хора, которыми Стюарт руководил в разные годы жизни. И тогда я поняла, как много людей знала и ценила Стюарта, и как много музыкантов он воспитал. Во время похорон родителей Стюарта я чувствовала спокойствие, потому что они прожили долгую и хорошую жизнь. Но на похоронах Стюарта все было по-другому. Его смерть шокировала всех, кто его знал. An email communication. In fact, the Sunday before he went into hospital, he had played here at Sherbrooke. Um, I was um, at uh, my niece's baptism at another church, and Stuart had played for me. And our last correspondence was an email from me to him to thank him for playing. And then I had heard that he'd taken unwell and was in the hospital. Um, and I sent all my best wishes. Then I heard it was quite serious, and then I heard it was unlikely he would survive, and that came as a terrible blow. Um, I was deeply upset. I still am actually talking about it. His legacy will always be his Russian mu music. His work is out there. It's in print. His living memory is something quite different. It's with the choir here, it's with me, it's with everyone he'd ever encountered. It's with Ruskaya Capella, it's with Svetlana. It's a terrible loss and far too soon. He was too young. Stuart is no longer with us and it is a tragedy. It was the end of an era and everybody in Ruska Capella felt it. And uh, when we were singing at Stuart's funeral, I could not sing. I was just standing there holding my music and I was crying. And he's missed sorely. 
Capella is different, but we're still standing. And Ruske Capella is there for Stuart, for Svetlana, for cultural connection between Scotland and Russia. One cannot put into words the loss that we feel through his untimely death. It was indeed very difficult, I think, for us all to participate in his requiem service. I hope that the quality of our singing on that particular occasion did justice to the effort that he had put in to the development of the choir. It wasn't easy to get to know, but when you did get to know him, it was just so rewarding. He was kind, he was loyal. He has left a gap that will never be filled. We still miss him dreadfully and feel that, you know, no one will ever be quite like Stuart. I was absolutely shocked because here was someone whom I knew well. I can't say closely because I don't think anyone knew Stuart closely. But as a good friend, as a sincere friend, I, I was absolutely shaken to the core. And given that he was only nine years older than me, that emphasised the sense of mortality that is lurking in us all. So many people have been touched by that death. His funeral was so well attended. For everybody that had that view of that individual, they carry a little piece of Stuart with them into whatever work they're doing in the world, both musically and otherwise. Я не беспокоюсь о душе Стюарта, потому что он прожил жизнь, творя добро и служа другим людям, включая меня. Конечно, он не был безгрешным, но сравнивая его с другими, я понимаю, что он был одним из лучших людей, которых я когда-либо встречала в своей жизни. He had such a deep sense of kindness, of sincerity, and of integrity. He was practically without parallel in our current world. После смерти Стюарта мне приходится разбирать его архив и библиотеку. Я как будто вместе с ним проживаю жизнь заново. И я понимаю, как он много сделал в своей жизни и насколько ценны результаты его работы. Мы со Стюартом хотели переехать в этот дом, когда перестанем управлять русской капеллой. И у меня особое чувство к этому дому. Мы были здесь счастливы. Кажется, что здесь мир спокойствия и гармонии. Я хотела бы жить здесь, когда все ремонтные работы будут завершены. Но я еще не могу принять решение.